Titanic, the second highest grossing movie of all time. You all know it and you've all seen it. This is a movie that so many people love to death, and some say that you don't just watch Titanic, you experience it. With so much popularity, it has undoubtedly become one of James Cameron's greatest flicks. But what isn't there to love about two fictional characters who were never on the ship and having historical characters tossed to the side even though they were actually there? Well, let's dive deeper into... Okay, probably not a good idea to go deep, but this is Titanic. So it starts off with some old footage from the actual event, but soon gets cut to present time where we see treasure hunters taking their sweet ass time looking for a diamond necklace called the Heart of the Ocean, which so happens to be on the sunken wreckage of Titanic. But unfortunately, the leader of the team is Bill Paxton, so I guarantee they're going to give up pretty easily. I mean, did you see what happened with his last job? Game over, man! It's game over! Back on shore, the team don't find any diamonds, but they do find an old drawing that they put on the news. And by pure coincidence, the last survivor of the disaster just happens to be watching and just so happens to be the woman in the picture, and surprisingly, she just happens to still be alive after all these years. This was 1997, people. How old could she possibly be? If she had lived, she'd be over 100 by now. 101 next month. Oh, bullshit. So as you can probably tell, the old lady calls the treasure hunters to claim that she's the woman in the drawing. But they're not sure they should believe her because, like the smart people that they are, they think she should be dead too. Thus leading them to do the logical thing of bringing her on board anyway. <sighs> Guys, you were doing so well. So the old lady is giving a tour of the ship, she comes across little trinkets from the Titanic, and they show her a poorly done CGI film of what had happened to the unsinkable ship. Even though she was already there, so it begs the question, why are they showing her again? Wouldn't this affect post-traumatic stress disorder? Oh dude, that is so totally fake. This like, you know what this needs, 3D. Oh. Wait, so rather than just asking her whether she has the necklace or not, Paxton and his team decide that they want to hear one of Grandma's bedtime stories about her experience on the Titanic. And that makes you my new best friend. F*** you, Bill Paxton! Who want to be friends with you? We now dissolve into a flashback of the Titanic with people coming aboard just before it sets sail. Thus entering our snooty rich characters, who want nothing to do with lower class folk. This consequently turns the old lady from present times into Kate Winslet, playing the ever so love it or hate it Rose. Do it, Bucator, Bucketer, um. Rose Winslet. Rose isn't at all happy with her life and she doesn't want to go to America. Well, specifically, they're going to New York, so I'm kind of with her on this one. Oh, and there's also this douchey fiancé named Cal, played by Billy Zane, with a pretty obvious wig. And there's Commander Sark, playing the role of Cal's bodyguard slash butler, I guess. But now this makes me wonder if the Titanic is being run by this fellow. It's a tough case, but I want him treated in the usual manner. Train him for the games, let him hope for a while, and blow him away. You got it. We then cut to an American gambler named Jack Dawson, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, who makes a bet to two Swedish guys that if he has a good hand of cards, he gets to have their tickets to America for him and his friend, who we barely get to know. Why does Jack want to get to New York? I have no idea. The movie never explains it. So inevitably, they win the tickets, but it turns out that the Titanic is going to be leaving in five minutes. Undoubtedly, he makes it, and thus the ship sails off to their doom while everybody says goodbye. But we can't just introduce the iceberg 25 minutes in. So to fill up some time, we're just gonna sit through a freaking hour doing nothing! Seriously, does anything really important happen before the ship starts sinking? The characters are just sitting around, talking, saying they're the king of the world. Jack and Rose get to know each other. They look at his drawings. Oh, that's charming. They have parties. They have a good time. They try on clothes for the parties. And Rose discusses why Picasso was so great, even though she can't seem to remember his first name. Ugh, get on with it! They're fascinating. Like being inside a dream or something. There's truth, but no logic. What does that mean? I guess this is Cameron's way of producing character development, but he is trying way too hard. Just because he could fill in time doesn't mean it'll still be interesting. Kathy Bates as the unsinkable Molly Brown can be kind of nice to be with, mainly because it's a bit of fresh air to having to hear rich people banter all day. But the only thing that's kept me gripped throughout this time is when Rose starts to get so depressed that she attempts to commit suicide. 
So Jack has to come save the day, and this is where the pre-Twilight losers meet. So Jack convinces Rose to come back, but unfortunately she slips on her dress and has to hang on for her life. Listen, listen to me. I've got you. I won't let go. Oh look, Trent. He manages to bring her back on board, but the guards heard her screaming and accused Jack of rape. They book him up, but Rose stops the guards to tell them what really happened. A little too late, I might add. And I would have gone overboard, but Mr. Dawson here saved me. Was that the way of it? Wait, you're asking the suspect if the story is true? Yeah, yeah I think you've got it a bit backwards, dude. Sadly, the attempted suicide scene only lasts for about 8 minutes, and like I said, it's the only vaguely interesting scene before the ship starts sinking. Apart from one other scene that for some strange reason people seem to remember the most, which I'm going to talk about now. That particular moment is the sketch scene. You all know this one. This is where Rose wants Jack to draw her naked like the women in his book. Odd request, but okay. Interestingly, this is one of the very first scenes shot in the production stage because some of the scenery wasn't finished yet. Well, this is a good start to Kate Winslet's role. As soon as she gets to the studio, she has to strip? Cameron, look, I know you have a thing for hitting on the leading lady, but you had Linda Hamilton at this time. I think you ought to stop. By the way, this is James Cameron himself doing all the sketches. What? Did you think Leonardo DiCaprio did all those drawings? <laughs> yeah, right. I bet he couldn't even draw a scribble. But yeah, I still don't quite understand why the scene is so famous. Maybe it's the way it's shot, maybe it's because people think it's cute and sweet. But I'm guessing it's most likely because of the few instances of Kate Winslet's boob. Yeah. Tell me when it does. was the most erotic moment of my life. Oh god, too much information, lady! Okay, so what else happens? Billy Zane finally starts becoming curious about Jack and Rose. He sends Commander Sark to go after them, but he loses them in the boiler room. Jack and Rose find an empty car. Rose lets Jack cop a feel, and they get down to business. Believe me, it's not as exciting as it sounds. In fact, by this point, you're probably so goddamn bored, you've pretty much lost the will to care anymore. Do the sailors in present time really have to hear all this? Paxton only wanted to know about the Titanic, so why is the old Rose telling them about her dull-ass cruise? Can we just skip to what happened to the ship, please? Anyway, Cal finds the drawing of Rose, and security comes down into the boiler room looking for Jack and Rose. But they seem to have gone. Back on deck, we see that Jack and Rose are quite proud of their little stunt and, oh, f More corny love lines and more making out. You know what? I can't believe I'm saying this, but these scenes are so freakishly boring and predictable, I'm actually rooting for the iceberg right now. To knock off Jack and Rose, not to sink the whole ship. Anyway, while all of this is happening, we see two lookouts who finally spot after an hour and a half, which also happens to be the midpoint of the whole movie, the iceberg. This inevitably scares the whole crew, and as fast as they can, they try to turn the ship. Which they do, but the side of the iceberg still manages to make a pretty deep cut into the hole. This is bad. No, no sh Sherlock! Okay, I'm not gonna lie. While I thought the first half of the movie was painstakingly tedious, the second half is actually very well done. Well, the bits without Jack and Rose, anyway. Because we finally get to see what happened on the Titanic while it was sinking. But every time the movie comes back to these two idiots, it leaves me disappointed again. It's a constant change of feelings. The best moments in the entire movie are what you see what everybody had to go through. And you feel really bad for these people. Sure, not every person is historically accurate. Hell, we barely get to see any of the characters that were actually on the ship. But it's still pretty damn sad to see people die in these different ways. It's not like the Poseidon Adventure or anything like that, because these are real people who are really dying in the ways that are shown in the movie. But Jack and Rose keep getting in front of your face like, hey, what you doing, what you doing, and you're constantly telling them to get out of your f***ing way. Well, back to what's going on. Rose takes Jack back to her room, and they come across David Warner again, who puts Rose's necklace in Jack's coat pocket to frame him from stealing it. When did he get that, and why is he framing Jack? Uh, whatever. After that, Thomas Andrews brings out blueprints of the Titanic, and basically tells us that it's going to be filled with a bunch of water in very little time, and they may not have a chance of saving everybody. So that means all the passengers are constantly told to put on a life vest because... It's quite cold out tonight. Oh yeah, it's a little chilly out there. Uh, it's only below freezing, it's not that bad. <laughs> you know what, why don't you just tell them to wear their earmuffs and mittens? I'm sure they'll be fine with that. So Captain Smith orders to send a distress call to CQD, but the closest boat is four hours away, which is not enough time before the boat sinks. We then see Jack being cuffed up and left alone with Commander Sarp. Who's really not the most reasonable of people? Back on deck while lifeboats are being lowered and flares are being fired, 
Rose eventually finds out that Jack is trapped and proceeds to rescue him. And here's what pretty much takes up about five pages of the script. Jack! Jack! Rose! Jack! Rose, I'm in here! Jack! 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 I'm here! Jack! Rose! Jack! Well, finally, when she finds him, it turns out that there isn't a key around to unlock Jack. Which means that Rose will have to go back and get help. But that doesn't go too well. The hell with you? Amen to that, brother. Not long after that, Rose manages to find a fire axe and heads back to Jack, where the water has strangely risen quite a lot even though she was gone for about 5 minutes. So she finds him again and of course manages to break the chains without breaking Jack's hands. Oh, this is cool. oh, and that's why I wear gloves. After that, a lot of time is used on the other passengers and how they're coping, but like I said, I prefer these moments so I'm not complaining. Eventually, Rose is being put into one of the lifeboats, and because only women and children are allowed to go in first, this means Jack is left behind. But after a while, she does one of the dumbest things I have ever seen in a movie. She jumps back into the boat. Lady, are you f***ing nuts? Isn't that like going back to Hiroshima before it gets bombed? You just don't do that. Why'd you do that, huh? You're so stupid, Rose. Is that Jack speaking or Leonardo DiCaprio? So seeing them making out like that fills the Zane train with steam, thus he steals Commander Sark's gun and tries to kill them. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. But yeah, this action scene really doesn't last that long because Cal runs out of bullets by the end and he informs David Warner, but mostly the audience, that he put the necklace into the coat that Rose is wearing. Cut back to DiCaprio and Winslet, after evading Billy Zane, they come across a kid all alone and in trouble. Why he can't get himself up the stairs is beyond me. Anyway, Jack and Rose grab the kid, but immediately get caught by his father who takes him back and kills them both. Wow, this was somewhat pointless. The giant wave carries our, I guess, heroes to a locked gate where the keeper has accidentally dropped the keys. At near death, they eventually find the right key and more shenanigans ensue back on deck, with one of the guards deciding to kill himself and the violinist trying to calm down the passengers with the second most famous song in the movie. So as this whole montage sequence goes, the ship sinks further and further and more people are dying. Unfortunately, we have to cut back to these two as they make their way to the front of the ship where Rose says they first met, even though I really couldn't give a crap. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't know I should be laughing at that, but that's hilarious. You could practically put a sound effect over that, it'd be awesome. <laughs> Eventually, the Titanic starts splitting into two, which causes the lower half to catch more water, dragging the whole ship down. Jack and Rose take a deep breath before they get in the water, and in very little time, get separated again. Though, this doesn't take long for them to find each other again. Swim, Rose! I need you to swim! Really? I need to swim in the water? You're talking crazy, Jack. So now we come to the flaw that I'm pretty sure everybody has pointed out. Jack and Rose find themselves a door they can use to stay out of the cold water. Whoops! <laughs> oh, you ninkum poops. Okay, let's try that again. Up you get, Rose. There you go. Alright, your turn, Jack. Jack, get on the door. Jack, why aren't you getting on the door? Oh my god, are you serious? You're telling me that only one of them can fit on that huge-ass door? You should be able to fit at least three people in there, maybe even four. Why the hell do these two idiots give up so early? Just because you try something once and it fails doesn't mean it won't do it again. But even then, how do they not notice the size of the door? If you have any sense of logic, you'd think a big door like that would carry more than one person. But nope! Jack decides to be a nice guy and let Rose hog all the space. What a suck up. Actually no, I shouldn't be taking it out on Jack. I should be taking it out on Rose. If she wasn't so brainless and didn't jump back on the boat, then Jack would have found the door for himself to use, and thus, he wouldn't have been frozen to death. Oh yeah, Rose! Did you think that Jack would still be alive after a while, even though he's in the freezing cold water? Because guess what? He's dead! Good job, Rose! You've killed your three-day boyfriend! I bet you even knew that Jack wouldn't let you freeze, because otherwise he'd be a massive douchebag. Jack. Jack. Oh, don't you start that again. Jack. But this isn't the only hole in the movie. Oh, no. 
Cut back to the lifeboat that Molly Brown is on. She tries to convince the other women that they should go back and rescue some more survivors. However, the quartermaster doesn't think that's such a good idea and threatens to push her overboard if she doesn't be quiet. Now, historically, here's the big problem. Molly Brown was an outspoken person. She did manage to convince the other women to go back, and she was the one who threatened the quartermaster that she would push him overboard. But according to the wonderful mind of James Cameron, she just sat back down and did what she was told. Utter bullshit. So when the boat does go back, it seems that they're too late, but Rose manages to find someone with a whistle and gets their attention. Back to present times, older Rose finally finishes the story by talking about the Carpathia. Cal managed to become a survivor, but this was apparently the last time Rose saw him because by the time it came to 1929, he put a pistol in his mouth. After she concludes the tale, it seems that she still has the necklace and throws it into the ocean. Which means that we just spent three hours of our lives talking about the Titanic for absolutely freaking nothing! We then see old pictures of Rose living a good life, and that's where the movie finally ends. Every night in my dreams. Oh yeah, I'm pretty sure nobody's gonna remember this song. So that's the mega hit that is Titanic, and boy was it dumb. I know I've complained a lot about it, but is there anything I particularly like about it? Well, for one thing, it's beautiful. It is a beautiful looking movie. The camera angles, the lighting, and the sets, wow. I'm serious. These are some of the best sets I've seen in a movie. The designers have completely replicated every single room that was in the Titanic, down to every little trinket. A perfect example would be the Chinese plates. Now you would maybe think that these would just be cheap plastic knockoffs, but no. The makers of this film actually managed to get the same company who made these plates to make them again, just to be smashed in the movie. It's stuff like that that makes this movie work. But it seems that Cameron focused too much on visuals and not enough on the story, which is mainly the key factor in a movie. While it does look amazing, you can only look at it for so long, and the story should be there to keep your interest. But that's not what this movie does. Like I said, I think I should have kept more attention on the other passengers and not on Jack and Rose throughout the whole film because they're just fictitious characters that weren't actually there. If it had more of that, then I could probably class this as one of the best films ever made. But as a whole, is this a bad movie? No. Is it overrated? Oh, you bet your ass. Is it historically accurate? <laughs> not in the slightest. This movie just takes a really long time to get going, and I mean a really long time. But some people do really like it, and as I've mentioned before, it's the second highest grossing film ever. It used to be THE highest grossing movie of all time until a few years ago when Avatar of all films broke the record. Ugh, we'll talk about that movie some other time. So for my score, I'll give Titanic a 7.5 out of 10, standing for a boring story but pretty to look at. Phew, well that took a while to get done, so uh, what next? Hmm. Well, we've had Skyfall come out some time ago, and I was thinking I could maybe do some James Bond games, so... It's not James Bond, is it? 